Hello. Uh, developer on the Tor project, and in fact one of the founders of the Tor project. Uh, he was an MIT undergrad here uh, a number of years ago at this point. Many. Uh, but uh, he'll tell you about uh, the system that you guys read about. Okay, so now I could start out by saying who did the reading, or I could say put your hands up if you didn't do the reading. But that could be a little embarrassing, and you might not want to actually let me know whether you did the reading or not and let everybody else know. So instead of what I'm going to suggest is everybody close your mouths, and this is extra easy if you're wearing a mask. If you did the reading, remain silent. If you didn't do the reading, hum softly. Humming is hard to localize. People won't know who's humming and who isn't. You will remain private and anonymous if you hum to let me know that you didn't do the reading. And this will let me know um, what I can go fast over and where I can go slow. All right, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right. Cool, cool. Another way to do that is if you don't want to, is you, I can say, put your hand up if you didn't do the reading, or if both of your parents have their birthday on an odd day of the month. You can work out the math for how to figure that one backwards. But however you do this, this kind of survey um, lets me know more than I would otherwise in if I were just asking and asking people to do something that would embarrass them. And it lets people communicate with me without being embarrassed. And it lets us all get a better presentation in the end, hopefully. And this is my standard demo of how private communication can actually help serve everyone's interests by letting that information flow anonymously. So I'm going to talk mainly about Tor. Tor is a network for making people an anonymous. We've got thousands of volunteer-operated servers. At first, friends of ours who liked cryptography software and wanted to fool around with it. Now, nonprofits, private individuals, universities, weird internet people, and more. We're serving uh, millions of users. It's hard to count them. They're anonymous. But I can talk more about how to count later. And pushing terabytes per second of traffic. It's used by lots of kinds of people, lots of kinds of folks. It's the largest system of its kind to date, although we need to become larger. And I can talk more about that later on, too. So when I say that, like, we're aiming for anonymity here. What, in what sense of anonymity do I actually mean? There are lots of senses that I don't mean. I don't mean anonymous just like don't write your name on it. Uh, some people have claimed at different times in the past that IP addresses are basically anonymous because they are not linked one-to-one -to, -one to individual people. By the same logic, street addresses are anonymous. If I say 77 mass have, that could be any number of people. If I say other addresses, it will be just one or two people. I don't mean any of those senses of anonymity. I mean a really technical sense from a paper on uh, the taxonomy and terminology in privacy systems by Fitzman and Hansen. And I mean anonymity in the sense that there's some adversary who's trying to figure out who's who and who did what. And that adversary can't tell which participant among some sets did some particular answer, did some particular action. Um, we could say they can't tell absolutely. That's not a very useful definition. What we would like to say is that they can't tell any better than guessing. So we know that somebody did that. We know that somebody sent this message. We don't know who. That's the anonymity in the sense we mean. A related property is unlinkability, where you see two actions, and you can't tell any better than guessing whether they were done by the same party or not. This is really handy because some of our quasi-anonymous activities are more private than others. Like if we say some stuff in a message and we say that stuff in English, say, and then we say some stuff in another message and we say that in English, well, that creates some odds that the two were by the same person. Now we, but if we're in a community where English speaking is really uncommon, then sending, have, then like sending, doing that can make our messages more linkable than they would be otherwise. 
Mm. One thing we don't mean usually is unobservability, which is another notion of privacy. We're not trying, unobservability is when you can't even tell who's participating in the system and who isn't. Um, we have some measure of that for anti-censorship stuff, and I'll talk about that a bit later too, but that is uh, generally a lot harder to achieve. So the reason I started working on this back some 20, 21 years ago was uh, I was looking at lots of stuff about privacy erosion on the internet. I cared a lot about it, and I thought I should really look into this neat technical stuff that people have done for private communication, and I wonder if we can build anything. But a lot of the technical stuff seemed, you know, sort of far off, like maybe maybe once somebody solves all of the problems and works out all of the bugs, it'll be time to start building. Um, but me and my friend Roger, we thought that we should start building on the soon side anyway, because it was important to sort of get a get a line in the ground, get a sort of demonstration project out there. First, to, we wanted to establish that there actually was demand for this kind of technology. There were mixed networks and remailer networks at the time that were not very well used. And some people took that as evidence that nobody wanted privacy. We took that as evidence that the usability was bad. But the other reason was we wanted to, we felt that sooner or later, people would start trying to ban systems of this kind, make them illegal. And we thought that it would be a lot easier to prevent that or to lobby against that if the systems already existed before anybody tried to ban them. It's a lot easier to make an argument against something that does not yet exist. It's a lot easy, easier to make an, a slippery slope argument about the evil effects of a technology that has not yet been deployed. We were worried that somebody at some point would say, this kind of anonymity technology is a horrible danger to society and must not be built, and all of the counter-arguments would be hypothetical because it hadn't been built. When that time came, we wanted the user base to already exist. We wanted people to already say, no, I'm using that. We wanted it to be out in the world and to people to be able to say, well, if this were going to cause the collapse of civilization, then it, you know, it would have done so by now, surely. You probably noticed from our paper that we've got a weird threat model. You've talked about threat models in class, um, and ours is a little bit fuzzy. And this is mainly due to our initial requirements. Our requirements were we wanted to fix a usability and utility requirement. Our first requirement was basically, this has to be usable for web browsing and basically anything else you can do over TCP. We weren't willing to say, all right, here's a system, but you can't use it with any other application that isn't built specifically for it, because that would throw away all the network effects of the internet. We wanted to actually be usable with the internet as it existed. And subject to that usability requirement, we wanted to maximize security. That's kind of how we got to the situation where we are. It's more of a de define the usability requirements and then see what you can actually prevent, protect against based on that than it is start in advance by declaring what you want to protect against and then scale down your usability un until your system is actually usable for that. But this actually, this usability actually matters for privacy though, because when you think about it, anonymity systems use a large number of users for other users to hide among. You can imagine a system that provides absolutely perfect, um, you really can't tell which message is coming from who, ever, no matter what your capabilities are, anonymity, but it's only useful for sending messages that take three days to arrive, and so only 100 people use it. I would contend that even though the system is very secure, those 100 users aren't getting much privacy, because if you see a message come out of the system, it came from one of those 100 people. 
And certainly for some use cases, it's more useful to have a system you can use for browsing the web, for using your favorite chat applications, for your favorite conference applications, that defends against fewer adversary types, but defends a much larger range of people against those types. That's kind of where we figured we wanted to start out with. So let me sort of take you through the general design. This is kind of an evolutionary explanation. I'll sort of talk about where we are, how we got there, for um, how you provide information. So in our, in our basic example, we've got somebody, the user, who has a computer and they want to access some service. Um, we can have this be pretty arbitrary. If they make a direct connection, then our eavesdropper can say, hey, I see that connection. It's a TCP connection. It's got IP addresses written all over it. Um, I can tell this user is talking to the service. All right. So we can imagine a single relay in the middle. Call this R for a relay. User goes here, goes to the service. All right. Well, you won't see IP packets um, exactly with both this with both the user's IP and the service's IP anymore. So that's a slight win. And if you stop here, you get some, some 1980s technologies. But of course, the problem with this is there's only one user. So anyone using this relay is necessarily that user. So add a bunch more users. Here, three represents a large number because um, the blackboard space is finite. Um, Okay, so in that case, somebody just watches, they just watch the proxy and watch this connection and say, all right, this is says go to S1, and this one says go to S2. And because this stuff is in plain text, they can just watch this. All right, so let's add, so add a layer of encryption. We can encrypt this message with a key shared by the user in the relay. And now watching this won't tell you. Well, all right. In this case, the attacker's next step is just to become the relay. Subvert it, steal it, break in, um, hack into it, run it from day one in the first place. And then they see everything. All right. So at this point, we generally say, and this is still 1980s technology. Let's add multiple relays. Here I'm just going to add draw two, but there's no reason you couldn't have more. And we could say that this relay and this relay have different keys they share with the users so that um, anything that this user wants to send to S1 gets encrypted twice. For, they encrypt it first with relay two's key, and then they encrypt it with relay one's key. And now this one, because it can't see inside this message, doesn't see the message, doesn't see where it's going to, they only see that this user is saying something. This relay doesn't see where the message came from. It only sees the message came from this relay. So and that it's going to S1, but it doesn't know who sent it. And at this point, as I said, we're still in the 80s, and we're about to have a big possible divergence in which way we make our system evolve at this point because of a kind of attack that we need to be concerned about called traffic correlation. So when you're writing... Um, a paper, if you really want to do stuff from a theoretical perspective, what you do is you say, assume that every user wants to send a single message of identical size once, and we will design a system to protect that. This is not a realistic assumption, but it is an assumption underlying many of the papers in the field of anonymous communications that you will read. I think papers with this assumption are still unfortunately publishable. There are no real-world situations, as far as I can tell, where the set of users is fixed. Each user wants to communicate once and say something of exactly the same size. In reality, P 
people want to communicate more than once. People have different communication patterns, and they want to say different things. So if this user wants to do a um, audio conference, that's going to involve lots of short little messages that have to have a fairly specific latency pattern. If this user is downloading video, that's going to involve a little bit of upstream stuff and a lot of stuff coming downstream. If this user is browsing the web or browsing even a specific website, that's going to involve a particular pattern of GET requests followed by a particular and identifiable pattern of responses. So if you're observing over here and over here, that is, if you're observing both the sender and recipient, you can notice correlations in traffic volume, traffic timing, and in general what happens after what, causality kind of stuff, and use those to say this stream over here is likely correlated with this stream over here. And that's really hard to resist. If you say we've got to resist that anyway, we have to resist an attacker who sees both ends, your options get more limited. You have to say, all right, we need to get closer to the universe where every user sends the same volume all the time. We could institute end-to-end -end padding where everyone is always sending and receiving exactly the same amount. Wow, your ISP is going to love that. Um, we could, and also it turned, um, or we could say, all right, we're going to institute random delays in the middle where when something is sent, it gets delayed for a certain while to hide um, timing patterns. Um, the trouble with using random delays to hide your timing patterns is a lot of your correlation, a lot of your protocols don't work anymore. You can't do your video ch chat anymore. Um, in extreme cases, you can't even do email. People don't find multi-day transmission times acceptable for email conversations. Um, a, um, another, you, you could have say, well, what if you do much smaller delays? Unfortunately, we don't have any research to suggest that really small delays help. You still, um, the kind of delays that we can be pretty sure make pretty strong arguments help are the kind that you could use to make your email come a bit slower, not the kind that you could still browse under. We think this is an interesting research topic if anybody wants to pursue it more deeply. Well, what about traffic padding? Um, what about instituting dummy messages that could just go one hop or could go multiple hops to disguise the volume of the traffic? Um, that can do some good, and it can disguise things against certain kinds of really obvious attacks. Like if you have one protocol that always sends three messages and gets two back, um, you can hide what protocol you're using pretty cheaply that way. That's not bad. But if you want to actually hide who you're communicating with and what your patterns are, it seems you need bigger volumes of traffic than most people are willing to accept. A 20% or a 30% overhead seems like most users will accept it. A 500% overhead, um, most users won't. This is an area of active research where that seems more promising to me right now, but it's not solved, and I don't know if and when it will be. All right, um, and another problem with that is Computer connections are fallible and people go offline. Um, you cannot, in fact, simulate being always online and sending traffic all the time because sometimes, if you're using your phone, sometimes you go into a train tunnel that doesn't have service. If you're using a computer, sometimes you reboot, sometimes the power goes out in your house, sometimes your UPS fails. And all of these arguments that, you know, there's no distinguishing this user from that user suddenly fall apart when you say this user is down, each user is down 1% or 1,000th of 1% of, of the time. You can make a statistical argument that it takes longer to track users, but that's a different argument and it's kind of harder to make. So instead, you could say, I'm not going to try to defend against somebody who sees both ends. Any attacker who manages to see both ends loses, um, just wins, and we lose. We're going to try to make it harder for anyone to be that attacker. And we're going to try to get the strongest system we can under the assumption that nobody is, that will lose if anybody is watching both ends and they know a little math. 
that's the direction that we took at Tor. If you want to see the other direction, I can totally um, suggest some references later on. But those systems are not generally much used because, you know, for the reasons I, d I described. So, all right. Say we want to just build this system and we're not going to try to defend against traffic analysis by somebody who sees both ends. But we don't want there to be too many such people. Well, this topology right here is pretty problematic because any attacker who compromises just two relays sees the whole network in this. And it doesn't even matter if we have a bunch in the middle because any attacker who still who compromises the, the first one and the last one in the chain will be able to correlate all of the user's traffic as it enters and leaves. Okay, so this is why you build a um, network of relays where, huh, where the relays exist in um, a sort of mesh, sort of clique topology, and they're all relaying stuff all the time. Users connect to different relays, and different relays connect to services. And under this system, if you like, there's no easy way to eavesdrop on the whole network. You instead, the more relays you compromise, the more users' traffic you see. But you don't get everything until you're actually approximating a global observer. That may be a benefit. All right, so we're going to, taking a step back from um, the topology question. Um, how do we actually make this efficient? Well, we'd like to minimize our public key cryptography because that could be expensive. Not, it's not so bad now, but you still wouldn't want to necessarily have to do public key on every single TCP stream. HTTP, ha excuse me, TLS has session resumption for a reason. So, all right, we'll say that the users, rather than encrypting messages with a public key for each step, will instead negotiate a stream through the network, and this will be some sort of persistent object with negotiated ephemeral keys that the user shares with each step. Like, say, they'll have one key that they share with this relay and one key that they share with this relay. And when they're done using this path through the network, they throw away those keys and the relays throw away those keys, and we're good again. Um, but they can use that for multiple connections without having to renegotiate for each one. That's good, and that'll help with latency. Um, another thing is, oh, this is yet another case where um, it's kind of neat doing this lecture over and over to watch stuff become uncontroversial. Um, 20 years ago, it was slightly surprising to some people that um, you needed authentication um, for the system to be secure, and you couldn't, and if you only did encryption on the traffic, it was trivial to break it. These days, people don't generally do encrypt but don't authenticate systems anymore, thank goodness. Um, but the attack there would be if somebody modifies your encrypted traffic here and the encryption is malleable, then they can observe, they, they can more easily observe modified patterns leaving the other side and specific patterns of corruption. So you have to have some kind of integrity checking to deal with that. So, all right. If we stop here, we generally get Tor 1.0. Now, there's lots of little fiddly details in the paper and in the specifications that um, to actually talk about how to make this work. Like, what handshake do you do to establish circuits. Um, the original onion routing design had a handshake where if you wanted to build a circuit through R1 and R2, the client would choose a secret key to be shared with each one. Why does, why does the child keep doing this? And the client would send to R1, it would have to tell the first relay, well, all right, it has to tell it what the second relay is. It has to tell it what key it wants to use and it has to give it a message to pass along. This will be encrypted to uh, relay 
one. This will be encrypted to relay two's public key, and this will contain um, the, let's say, the service you want to connect to. It wouldn't really work like this. You'd actually, yeah. let's present the real design. We'll say, nobody, this is the end of the circuit, and here's the shared key, and there's nothing more to pass on because there is no next step. This multiple layered structure was the so-called onion that the onion routing design from the 90s was based on. Um, it turns out we didn't want to use this particular handshake. Um, and, and the way this would work, I'm sorry, the user would send this to R1. R1 would decrypt this part. See, okay, I have to send this blob to R2. Here's the key I share with the client. I send the blob on to R2. All right, R2 decrypts this and says, oh, I have a shared key with somebody, K2, and I don't have to send anything else to anyone. A couple of problems with this. First, there's no foreign secrecy um, on this message. Anybody who intercepts this message has all eternity to compromise the public keys for these relays and reconstruct the K1 and K2 and read the traffic that the client sent. That's, you know, generally considered a bad thing. Another issue that faced us more at the time, it was patented. And so we could not, in fact, build it. Technically, um, the patent was held by the U.S. Naval Research Labs, and we were at the time working on a subcontract for a researcher affiliated with the U.S. Naval Research Labs to try to build an open source implementation of onion routing. Um, but the paperwork required to get permission from themselves in order to release their own patent in an open source implementation was beyond what they could figure out how to do. So the patent was a completely non-starter, even though they held the patent. Um, Fortunately, there was an alternate approach. If you instead use a um, hop by hop process, where first the user sends something to R1 to establish a shared key that's shared by the user in R1, and then the user uses their handshake, their, their, their circuit through R1 to R2 to establish a separate K2. That kind of in, in each step making the circuit one hop longer, this kind of thing was not covered by the patent and allows you to do the kind of interactive handshake that makes uh, forward secrecy possible. The details of the current handshake are not those in the paper. They are on possibly one of the what's new with Tor blog posts you may have read. The full details are in the specifications, but Basically, what they, the property that you need is it needs to be a one-way authenticated key exchange where the user is certain that they now share a key with the server, and the server is certain that they share a key with somebody, but they don't know who. So what's next? OK. So that was one of the early details to figure out. Um, there are a ton of, of details to talk about. Oh, another thing to figure out. Um, what do you actually send once you've established one of these sessions? You could send, like, do you send IP packets? Do you send TCP frames? Do you invent some sort of application-specific thing? Early versions from the 90s of Onion Routing did an application-specific protocol where every individual application needed its own kind of proxy built into the system. Um, it was a headache. No one really used it much. Instead, um, but it turns out you don't want to do just raw TCP frames or raw IP packets because IP stacks are horribly identifying. If you've ever used Nmap, you can like find out details about individual implementations of TCP IP in sufficient detail to identify operating system, operating system version in many cases, and the more you get to interact with somebody's TCP stack, the more information you can gain about them, and even sometimes gain about other active connections that they may or may have to different places. So we did not want to transmit IAP. Instead, we decided, all right, let's have the user's software at this point just speak some kind of relatively friendly proxy, generic TCP proxy protocol. At the time, that was SOX because it was the most straightforward one. Um, we still mostly use SOX, although we support a few more at this point. 
And we're not going to do TCP end-to-end. -end. We're just going to send traffic end-to-end. -end. And we're just going to send bytes end-to-end. -end. And we're going to be a reliable in-order transport. This is one of the details that actually messed us up a great deal over time. It made our initial implementation more secure and certainly more buildable because we were security people, not by any means networking people. But it turns out when you try to provide a reliable in-order transport with this kind of building blocks, you wind up with huge buffers everywhere. And these huge buffers everywhere are not only uh, a performance nightmare, but they're also a denial of service vector that people can use to crash intermediate th to realize by running them out of memory or crash stuff on other ends by filling up their buffers when they're not reading. We are still w working on better stuff there. There is a challenge, however. Suppose, okay, we, suppose we say we're going to back off of the reliable in-order assumption, and instead we want to send something like IP packets end-to-end. -end. We'll generate them ourselves to avoid the IP fingerprinting issue. Well, that kind of means that each of these is allowed to drop and reorder packets. That's, that's what we mean when we say we're doing an IP-like system and we're, we're going to no longer do reliable in-order delivery. We're allowing packet drop. We're allowing reordering. Well, if we do that, we've created a great way to send a covert signal from end to end. Um, we to you know, say, hey, if I drop, I'm going to encode the client's IP address by which packets I drop. If there's an honest relay at the other end of the connection, then um, things will be fine. They, we, they'll recover from the packet drop, and no one will be the wiser. But if there's another dishonest relay at the other end of the connection, then they'll be able to trivially de decode where the client is coming from without having to do any of these fancy correlation attacks. So there's a, we have a white paper about that issue, and we're working more on that. But to date, most of our work on improving this stuff is still going with the reliable in-order assumption and trying to work around the congestion issue by throwing away connections whose buffers violate certain heuristics when we're out of memory and by improving our congestion control algorithms. So there's uh, two neat directions to go forward from this. I'm, I sort of alternate which one I do each time I do this lecture. Last time I talked about the onion services. This time I want to talk about node discovery, which is actually kind of a more interesting problem in a lot of ways. Well, actually, they're both interesting. Anyway, this time it's node discovery. So this user here has to know which relays exist on the network. If they don't know where the relays are, they can't actually connect to any of them. Um, this problem was actually more or less unexplored in the literature, although there were a number of ad hoc solutions for it before we actually started writing up design after stupid design, um, which is also a good lesson about um, the research project process and something that MIT, lots of MIT research groups do particularly well. When you actually have to build the system that you're designing, there are lots of places where you find that you can no longer wave your hands and say, then a miracle occurs. So all right, the user needs to find out what relays there are. Something that lots of peer-to-peer -peer systems would do at the time is you find one relay and you ask it, who else is on the network? That's a bad design because if you find one dishonest relay, it can tell you only other dishonest relays. It can tell you 100 versions of itself and all of your paths will be fully controlled by dishonest relays in that case. Not desirable. All right. So we could say ship with a full list of, of all of the relays and their public keys and hope that this never changes. That was the approach that lots of mixed nets took in the 90s. Um, it didn't work so well for obvious reasons. You had to keep it updated manually, and all of the update processes were ad hoc and kind of busted. Also, it effectively slows down the rate at which people can rotate their keys, which is bad for security. You could have a single server that is trusted and all of the relays upload their information to, 
and it keeps track of which relays exist and throws out the bad ones somehow, and everybody downloads their stuff there from there. The two problems there are is the trust bottleneck. Um, I'm sure you've covered the uh, how the word trusted in computer security does not necessarily mean the same thing it would in real life. Uh, trusted points are bad. The other problem is that making every user of the network regularly contact a single address to download something is bad for scaling and bad for observability. I knew, th I, I said before that we weren't trying to keep an eavesdropper from telling whether people were using the network or not. But surely it's undesirable to have one IP address where if you watch that one IP address, you learn about every single user of the privacy network and who they are. All right, so let's, let's distribute that. Let's have a multi-signed document saying who's on the network that has to be signed by a number of trusted parties. And clients will believe it if it's signed by some threshold K out of all of the N trusted authorities. It's not great. You can imagine lots of better things, but, but the better things are subject to interesting attacks. There's good e-research papers going in that direction. We didn't know how to build any of them. I still don't trust any of those research papers. Um, we'll go with this K out of N trust design. And let's have this document be cacheable. Making this multi-signed document be cached in different locations means that you don't all have to have every client go to a single point anymore. And it makes the system more scalable, which starts to matter when you have hundreds of thousands of users. All right, that's pretty good so far. Um, it turns out that there's a even better way that we've designed that we haven't built yet. Um, but the design, but it's kind of a neat design. So I'd like to talk about it. Uh, this, this design is called walking onions in the research literature. It's, the idea is that you still have the set of authorities come up with a single consistent list of relays that everybody knows about. Let's say there's four relays. Um, and you still have the authorities sign this list. But now the authorities only need to distribute this list to the relays and not to all the individual clients. Um, what I'm about to present is an oversimplified version of how it would actually, of how it actually works. Um, when the authorities generate this list, one of the things that it includes is a list of ranges associated with each relay. Let's say we're using the range one to 100 for our, for our uh, randomness. So we'll say zero to 25 is relay one, 26 to 50, uh, 51 to 75, 76 to 100. Please ignore the fact that I have, I'm gonna change this to one. All right. So um, now when a client wants to build a random path, the client only needs to know some first hop on the network. The client, the client still will still choose their paths randomly in walking onions. But instead of saying, I would like to connect to relay R1, they'd say, I'd like to connect to the relay on the index at position, roll the dice, 24. Um, so they ask the relay to extend them to whoever is at 24. And the relay does that. And the path extends. And the client never needed to get a list of the relays on the network. Only the relays needed to have that list. Well, there's a few other things you need to make this design work. First, you need to have the keys for each relay, the, the public keys for each relay associated with them here, so that when the client does the handshake, the client will, get, will be able to authenticate, yes, I really was given a, relay, a handshake with the relay at position 24. You also need these little individual pieces of this index to be detachable yet still signed so that you can send back this blob to the client, which is sufficient for the client to determine, yes, index 24 really went with this relay and this public key. So that means that these individual blobs need to somehow be authenticated with the authorities' key, public keys. And it also means they need to be time stamped because they'll change over time 
And it means a bunch of other stuff, too. There is a, if you search for walking onions, there's a paper about actually the fiddly details to make this design work. But it's pretty neat, and we want to build it. But uh, more about the state of the software coming up. That's the state of our directory stuff. What's the next good topic? Oh, we could talk about choosing paths. We could talk about, or we could talk about onion services. Um, please hum if you'd like to hear about choosing paths. Please hum if you'd like to hear about onion services. Please hum if you would like to hear about abuse. I hear the most for abuse. I will try to do a brief intro to onion services and significant and a brief intro on the seat of the um, abuse situation. Okay, onion services. So all of the stuff here assumes that your users want to talk to the services, and these services are public and identified. Like this is, you know, um, well, let's see, we, this is just like your public websites, your public services, whatever. Suppose you want a service that is itself hidden. Well, that's the, we already have an anonymity network. Maybe we can use it to build a way to do replies anonymously. Where was that? All right. So one design that you see sometimes is a bulletin board. I am a service. I want to run. Um, I want to let people connect to my hidden website. So I'll just post my identity on, I'll use the anonymous network to post on, hey, to connect to this service, um, visit some temporary location over here, and meet me. That's, um, you got to pull, that, 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 that could work. It's a little hard, though, because you actually have to start working out the details of the bulletin board. Um, what we're doing, and also, how do you actually hand out these addresses? You're saying um, you, need, you probably need to use public keys if you want to be hard to impersonate, which we presume that you do. All right. So one aspect of the design you also want is you want to have traffic relayed over um, many points, even if only a small number of points are used to introduce your hidden service. The, the reason for that is that you want the points to, to choose the points to that introduce you based on being pretty robust, but you'd like the actual traffic to be more widely spread so that uh, you can get better bandwidth characteristics and you don't overload a single point on the network. So the whole complicated thing as we put it together is you've got some S that wants to run a hidden service. They have to connect through the network to several randomly chosen by them introduction points. Not that kind of IP. This is a different kind of IP. Um, these are points that could be used to send introductions to them. This is, just, this is just the same relays as we saw before, but they're fulfilling another role in the protocol. Here, if anybody says, I want to connect to x.onion, where x is a public key, they send it on to S1. They send that request on to S1. All right. Um, and when S1 establishes it, it needs to prove that it possesses the public key so that the right request to actually get sent to it. After it does this with a few introduction points, it has to publish, again, with this twisty line that I'm going to use to indicate anonymous multi-op connections. It's got to publish a signed document saying, here are all of my current introduction points at this time. That has to be signed with the same public key as identifies the service. This is currently instantiated as a um, hash ring over the set of relays on the network. Now, you don't want a predictable hash ring because if you could tell what positions on the hash ring something was going to get stored at in advance, you could just attack those and censor it. Or you could publish some, you could pick your own keys to try to wind up at those points in order to censor it. So instead, we um, have 
the actual position on the hash ring, determined partly by the key, partly by the day, and partially by a random value that changes day by day and is uh, developed and is derived in a hopefully secure and unpredictable manner by the authorities on a daily basis. It's a commit and reveal protocol, which is not perfect, but it works in practice. So at this point, the server is online. Here comes the user. They want to connect to x.onion. So they figure out, all right, based on the current day, the value of x and the global random value, what directories do I ask? Okay, those directories. And it goes and asks the directories, and it gets a little signed document with the right public key. Then it says, and that signed document will have a list of introduction points. In parallel, the user will say, all right, I'm going to need some place where I'm going to talk to the service. So I'm going to pick a rendezvous point. Again, this is just another, just another relay in a different role. The user builds an anonymous connection to the rendezvous point and one to one of the introduction points. And once it's done this, it says, hey, introduction point, please tell, please relay the following encrypted message. The encrypted message is encrypted to something authenticated with this key. And the encrypted message contains, hey, um, I'm waiting at this rendezvous point. If the service requires any authentication, it has to contain the authentication too. The service gets it, says, oh, there's somebody waiting for me over here. We connect. And now this user has a multi-hop circuit here. This user has a multi-hop, the service has a multi-hop circuit here. They finish their handshake using secret information, key exchange information sent by the user over this to the introduction point in this encrypted thingy. And they negotiate a shared key and they can finally communicate with one another. It's a bit complex, but it actually works in, in practice. There are some more details that weren't in the original design. One of them is it turns out that it's desirable not to have these x dot onion values. It's, it's, it's desirable not to have the directories or the introduction points be able to enumerate these things. Um, instead, so instead, the current design uses basically a derived key of the day system using a one-way key derivation algorithm, where basically if you know the current day and the current shared secret and the value of x, you can derive the public key of the day corresponding to x. If you know the private key that generated x, you can generate the private key of the day corresponding to the public key of the day and use those, but you can't go backwards. So what that means is that the directory and the introduction points can figure out the private key of the day, but they can't use that to actually list all of the x.onion values and actually connect to anybody. That was a big redesign, and it took longer than it had to for uh, a lot of reasons. And I'll talk more about getting better at development in a moment or two. Uh, the, the other topic was abuse. Man, were we wrong about abuse in the original paper. We thought that the problem with abuse would, was that people would connect to services that didn't want them there, and that the solution to it in the original paper was exit policies, where each relay could say, I'm only going to deliver traffic to a subset of addresses and ports on the internet. This wasn't too bad an idea. Like, if you wanted to exist on the internet in 2001, 2002, then not being an SMTP relay was a really good idea, because you would get blocked by everybody if you were an open SMTP relay. And if you got a complaint from somebody, sure, you could block their specific IP. It turns out, though, that the actual major problem from an operator's perspective and a user's perspective in abuse is that even though abusive users represent a fairly small amount of the traffic based on what research has been done, it's hard to do this research ethically because it does impact uh, human subjects. But based on what research is done, 
The abusive users are a um, comparatively small fraction. The problem is, though, many systems either use human identity or IP addresses as a way to limit the amount of abusive traffic they see. That is, if somebody vandalizes Wikipedia over and over and banning their account doesn't work, you ban their IP address. And that's fine, except when the IP address is shared by a lot of users. This isn't something that happens because because network um, security people are lazy or, or because they actually believe that people can't share IP addresses. It's because the existing technologies they have kind of break down when you can't do the, a solution with rate limit by IP or block by IP. Um, and the fraction of users that they think they would get by doing something more sophisticated doesn't seem high enough to motivate them. So what can we do about that? We got two solutions that we're kind of working on both. One of them is an outreach thing to encourage users to say, hey, you should allow anonymous access to your site. You should, you know, it's valuable for people who don't want to be traced to be able to use your service. We should work together to come up with some mechanism to make that possible while limiting abuse. This approach works for some people, not others. Um, another thing you can look into is other ways to ensure that abuse remains rate limited without compromising privacy. You can imagine, say, using blind signatures to issue people tokens on a rate limited basis where each token allows the, them to open a certain number of connections over time, but they can't open more than that to do scraping. Um, and you can then imagine, all right, let's have certain relays only allow these anonymous token-based connections to leave the network so that anybody using those relays, their traffic will contain less bulk DOS than it would otherwise. And maybe these IPs will get blocked less. This is part of what some of the engineering behind um, Apple's privacy pass kind of thing is, uh, not uh, privacy pass, whatever their uh, VPN thing is, is called that they're working on. Uh, we'll see if that goes anywhere. There are more related designs you can do. There's a entire category called anonymous blacklistable credentials that let you block some, block the user behind some activity from your site without actually knowing who you blocked but you'll know if you see them again. Uh, but if you don't block them, you don't get to find out who they are. That's um, rather complicated, but if you search anonymous blacklistable credentials, you get a few papers on that. And there are lots of evolutionary steps that we've got to continue to take here. We've got to keep moving on the cryptography. We will need a, a prose quantum design in a little while. Our original cipher is this dopey, semi-malleable thing based on AES and counter mode with a little bit of SHA-1 to avoid tagging. It's not as bad as it could be because we're not relying on pre-image resistance properties, but it's still pretty awful. We hope to have that replaced wicked soon once we can get something similarly efficient. We've got the congestion control thing I talked about, and one thing that we're doing that I'm pretty excited about is we are rewriting the software. C seemed like a really good idea back in 2001, 2002-ish, when we were starting out and we needed to be ported everywhere. Um, this was back in the day when you could not rely on programs written in even C++ to work on multiple architectures and getting anyone to download a Java runtime was kind of an uphill battle and stuff. But C has shown its age for a lot of reasons. We are doing a project to rewrite in Rust right now. It's usable. We are going to have a 1.0 that won't have the anti-censorship support and won't have hidden services, um, but we'll have all the other stuff by October or so. And by a year after that, we should have a full 2.0 in Rust that will have complete client support. The project for that is already.torproject.org, 
which takes me to just about the end of the presentation before I start taking questions. Um, I'm just going to show you some neat websites for further reading if I have not bored you off the subject already. rd.torproject.org is our project to rewrite Tor in Rust. Um, it's fun. It's easy. It's well-documented. It's well-specified. Um, if you're looking for something neat to hack on, come on over. spec.torproject.org is where we keep the latest versions of all of our protocol specifications, and there's links to our design proposals. The proposal system is what we use to evolve the protocol over time. Um, we find it really useful to have accurate and acknowledged technical specifications. These specifications are what has actually allowed us to do a second compatible implementation of the protocol. Without them, we would be reverse engineering our own code and not actually having a worthwhile implementation. But it's not just for us that the specifications are valuable. They're valuable for research. Um, most researchers would rather not read the details of the code. They'd rather work to the design. But for the, to work to the design, it, they want a committed to document where like, they're not going to write some paper to attack our system, and then we say, oh yeah, it doesn't work that way anymore. So by trying to keep an up-to-date set of specifications, we've actually managed to get really, really good feedback from members of the research community over time to help us improve our system. Freehaven.net slash Anon Bib. It's not as complete as it used to be. There's been a lot of research it hasn't covered, but it is a pretty good bibliography on anonymity papers up to about five to seven years ago. If you look for papers that cited the papers there in Google Scholar or your favorite source for interesting PDFs on the internet, you will get lots of cool stuff about anonymity designs, not just traffic anonymity, but uh, attacks on traffic anonymity, traffic analysis-based stuff, statistical anonymity, data anonymity, and more. Nick M at torproject.org is my email address. Feel free to contact me and ask me any questions you want. Um, and, you know, thanks for listening today. I hope this has been more interesting than whatever you were going to do if you skipped lecture. And, um, yeah, I'm here till you all got to go, and I would be really happy to take questions. Thanks for having me today. I can also do interpretive dance. Yo. Why is the... Oh, this here is a... In, in this design, this is on your routing version, like version zero. Um, this key is a shared symmetric key that was encrypted with the public key of the relay. So the relay would have a public key. The client would pick a random symmetric key to use for that session and encrypt it to the relay's public key. And they would also have a different symmetric key that would be encrypted to the public key of the second relay on their path. Um, the reason for using a symmetric key in that case is, of course, that public key cryptography is a lot slower than symmetric cryptography. You don't want to use RSA, which is what we were on the time at the time, for your traffic, or even elliptic curve for every single packet. You want to do that for a session to establish a key and then use a block cipher or stream cipher, um, ideally with some sort of authenticated encryption mode for your traffic. Good question. Yo. Ooh. Do I use Tor by any chance? Um, yes, I do, and not just to test it. How many people use Tor every day, on the daily? Um, I'm going to give you two answers, both of which are interesting, but none of which are a number. The first one is if you go to metrics 
www.torproject.org, you will get our best estimate um, on a day-by-day -day basis. Usually before I do this lecture, I check metrics.torproject.org so I can say this many users, this many relays, this many everything. This time I forgot and I am sorry. Another answer is, how would you actually count? Um, anybody want to figure out how to count the number of users if you're trying to maintain everybody's privacy? You feel free to just shout out ideas. Yeah, have, you, you could have each node report like hashes of IP addresses. Um, now hashes are fairly, there's only, um, you know, there's only 4 billion IPv4 addresses and 4 billion is searchable. So you wouldn't want to do like just a hash of IP addresses. You'd probably want to do some sort of um, different counting algorithm. We do an even simpler one. Um, and I'll tell you a really cool counting algorithm that we want to use in a second. But here's a simple version. You have each relay count the number of distinct IP addresses it sees in a day, hashing them internally with some kind of, or in an hour or whatever. Then you do this on a couple of relays that happen to be, where you happen to know who runs them and you trust their reports. You look at the routing algorithm. You see what fraction of all users you expect to use those relays. You m divide by that fraction, and that will give you your estimate of the number of relays on the network. Now, this still requires the relays to remember how many distinct IPs they've seen. Here is a cool algorithm that you can use to remember, that you can use for counting users without actually having to count the users. So we're going to take a random number for the lifetime of our counting. We're going to call the, um, or another way to do it is you can think of it as saying, we're going to pick a different randomized hash function every day. Call the, we'll, we'll do this at the, at the relay level, say. We'll call the randomized hash function H. We're going to take the hash of each incoming IP and we're going to look at, um, let's say, the last um, 32 bits of that hash. We're going to look at the last 32 bits of that hash. And we're going to count. No, even, I'm, I'm thinking of two algorithms at the same time. We're taking the hash of the IP. It's a randomized hash of the day. It's, um, for privacy, it could even be a secret hash. And we're looking at how many consecutive zeros there are at the end of the hash. So half of the, the IPs, right, will have no zeros at the end. A quarter will have exactly one zero at the end, assuming that this is a good pseudorandom function. Um, a eighth will have exactly two zeros at the end, and so on. We count the zeros at the end, and We just increment, or even we set, we have a bunch of accumulators for each number of, of possible zeros at the end. We, you start out each accumulator. This one represents no zeros at the end. This is one zero at the end. This is two zeros at the end. You set each accumulator at zero. Whenever you see an IP address that has a corresponding number of zeros at the end, you set the accumulator to one. So this here, I've seen something that has um, one zero at the end. You never set it any higher than one. This is just a set of bits that you set over the course of the day. So you can figure if this is a good random function, with increasing probability, the more distinct IPs come in, the more, the more higher odds you will set more and more bits over here. Like, like the odds of actually getting anybody who has 32 zeros at the end. Only one in four billion users will actually have that, will actually have that property. That might be a little too rare. You might want to say, okay, I'm going to clip at one in a million properties. But anyway, if you do that, you can then use a formula that is, a formula that is approximately interpret this as a binary number, um, exponentiate it, multiply it by a constant factor, and that gives you a pretty good estimator of the number of users with a certain amount of error because you're throwing away information. Now, you can do even better than that. There, the error can be rather high. So if you do this, though, with several independent hash functions, 
and several independent sets of, of accumulators, then you can get an even better estimator. And in fact, you can do even better than that. You could have all, a bunch of relays all do this using a shared set of hash functions and, um, up, and then use a secure multi-party computation approach to um, compute the or of everyone's bits at each position and then do a network-wide um, computation over those ordered together values. If you're interested in more stuff on this, which we did totally not invent, um, the paper I remember is a system that I think Google doesn't use anymore, but the system was called Hyperlog Log. That's hyper log log. Um, it's not state of the art anymore, but if you search for that, you'll get a paper. And if you look at all of the references in that paper, and you look at the interesting stuff that references that paper, you'll get a pretty cool tour of this field and other neat counting tricks you can use. And I know that was totally not your uh, question, but I, I think the answer is a few million. Yeah. How do you feel about people using the network for crime? How do I feel about people using the network for crime? It depends on the crime. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think that stuff that harms other people is a good thing, and I wish they wouldn't use my software for that. I do think that um, circumventing censorship is a good thing, and I'm generally in favor of people doing that. Mm, I don't like it when I have mixed feelings towards tax evasion, but <laughs> yeah, I think in general there's sort of a question to be asked of does the world get better when there is more or less safety valves around um, government controls. I don't think that technology or security technology ever is a complete barrier to law enforcement. I think it is a cost multiplier. I think that, um, for example, if you want to catch someone who is selling drugs over a dark marketplace, um, you can do that. You need to do police work. You need to wait for them to make configuration mistakes. You need to wait for them to have a network outage that correlates with the network outage in a particular locality. You need to wait for them to do something stupid. You need to trick them into meeting with you in person. All, you know, law enforcement stuff. I don't think that this kind of technology makes law enforcement harder. What it does is it makes it harder to do um, massive dragnet surveillance, massive watch everybody all the time collect the data on everybody and then decide um, what to criminalize kind of stuff. I think that probably we have a better world when the minimal cost of invading people's privacy is a bit higher than it is now. And as long as I continue to believe that, I think we're going to keep on working on privacy technology. I'm sorry, my hearing is bad. Can you be louder? Ah, uh, yes. The question is how to we deal with people trying people trying to censor Tor or keeping them from reaching our website or stuff. Um, preventing them from we reaching our website to download our software, we generally use word of mouth other websites. If you can't even find out about Tor through any means, then we have no way of helping you. Um, assuming that you have found someone who can get you the software and you'd like to use it. Well, there are several ways to censor the network itself that we try to resist. The, the two ways, good ways to censor the network are you look at these connections here and you say, all right, what properties do these connections have that I can use to detect them and block them? First off, they're going to have certain unusual traffic properties. Um, 
they might be using different TLS flags than web traffic. They might be more longer, more long lived or something. And then you can say, all right, let's look at the specific list of relays that there are. This is a public list. We can download this list every day and use that to censor people. We've seen both of these approaches used at times. Um, the pretty much everyone who wants to censor us goes for the list of relays. That's the cheap version. Although some people actually do pay money to their censorship providers for this. Please do not leave MIT and work for censorship providers. It is, you will be very sad and you will, you will hate yourself. I've, I've read some of their internal stuff. Um, nobody has a good time doing it long term. Um, the harder way is to actually look at traffic patterns. This is an arms race. Um, it's led to weird situations, like for a while there was a certain prime number that was banned in, there was a certain encoding of a certain prime number where if you sent it on the Iranian internet, you would be disconnected. Um, it's one of my proudest achievements, getting a prime number banned by a major government. Um, but, so the list of, our solution to that is twofold. First, there, the, concept, the first concept is bridges. There is a large number of relays that are not published on the official list where you need to find them through less automatable means. Word of mouth, having them pre-installed with the software, stuff where the sensors have a harder time getting to them. Of course, the sensors also have human power too, and that's a bit of an arms race. Another thing to do is to change the pattern of this traffic. For this, we support a series of traffic obfuscation plugins that we call pluggable transports. We used a pluggable design rather than trying to change our single thing because iterating really fast with our C architecture is hard and was even harder back when we needed to do that. And also we wanted to provide an interface point, an extension point where people could obfuscate the protocol without having to worry about weakening its security. So that's what we did those plugins for. And there are hybrid approaches. Um, there's so-called domain fronting, where for a long time, there was a great trick you could do on all of the cloud providers where the SNI value, the, um, the server name that's sent as part of the TLS handshake that the sensors used, uh, that the sensors could see because it wasn't encrypted, um, didn't actually need to match the um, web address in your HTTP request or the host address in the HTTP header. So you could, so the clients would like connect to say um, some, something on AWS or some other cloud provider, provide an innocuous looking SNI host name that will get their sensors to allow it, and then connect to an actual bridge via HTTP to make a better connection. Um, this works less well than it used to because that same approach got used for command and control by a number of botnets and a lot of the cloud providers don't allow it as much as they used to. But there's similar approaches that kind of do. Right, one now is having a large number of user provider proxies um, that are given out over a similar scheme. But generally anything where you can provide a innocuous looking front that introduces people to other providers um, that will actually relay their traffic onto the Tor network seems to work pretty well. The system that currently seems to be working best for us is the one called Snowflake, but we try to keep a few others in reserve because we like to demoralize the sensors by having a few other things to roll out as soon as they effectively block one, but we don't think there's ever gonna be an unblockable system. Um, so far, the countries that seem most effective at blocking Tor are the ones that develop their censorship in, in government domestically. The ones that buy their, their censorship software from Western companies, um, the censorware providers there like to keep their clients on an upgrade treadmill, so they never do a very good job of blocking Tor because they want to make sure that we will unblock them so that they can sell version N plus one that blocks Tor version N so that we can do N plus, so that the clients need to keep paying for the next version. Um, honestly, I think this whole affair is kind of scummy and that internet censorship is probably a bad thing, but that's generally where it's at right now.
And that's a good question. We got about four minutes before the class is officially over. I'll be hanging around after if anyone wants to talk to me about stuff. Yeah. Is there a mechanism for routers to detect malicious routers? Um, we have a number of mechanisms that we try to use to detect certain kinds of um, attack. Some kinds of attack you can detect. For instance, if somebody is trying to do TLS man in the middle attacks on anybody on, um, on, on TLS websites, Okay, we can't tell whether it's the relay or their ISP doing the man-in-the-middle attack, but um, you can scan and detect that. Another one that you can scan and detect is if somebody is stealing and using credentials that are sent in plain text through them, you can detect that through honeypots. And we have some projects to do that. The earliest tool that we had for that was a pile of Perl and Python scripts called Snakes on a Tor. Now... I believe it's Tor Exit Scanner is the latest version, and there are some unreleased extensions to do that because for that, unfortunately, we do need security through obscurity. Now, there's some attacks we can't detect. Like, if someone is just recording all of the traffic they see and not doing anything with it that's detectable, there isn't a way that you can detect that. You can imagine, all right, well, suppose that we actually get trusted computing, and just imagine you actually believe that trusted computing works and there, there's no holes around it. You could, in theory, in that case, detect, you know, you could say, all right, you must only be running, like, a trusted secure operating system and a Tor relay and no other software and no logging turned on. But, A, that would just move the locus of trust to whoever compromised your chip to your manufacturer, A. Trusted computing has never actually been done securely in a way that stayed secure for more than a couple of years, so it's maybe a bit good to be skeptical about that, B. And C, you can still watch on the wire. You can't, trusted computing can't t prove that there's no oscilloscope watching the traffic leave the router. Um, or even that, you know, the upstream router, the, the upstream internet router from the, the Tor relay isn't itself logging traffic. So there's some kinds of attack that you just can't detect remotely. And for those, about the best we can do is to try to avoid suspicious patterns of control. Like if there's, a lot of, if there's a lot of relays operated by the same entity that don't, that try to conceal this fact, for instance, that's a suspicious thing that we can detect. Um, how to, some ways to notice when there are relays run by the same entity who's trying to conceal the fact are, are left to the reader. And unfortunately, no, there is no way that actually is guaranteed to work for an arbitrarily clever entity. Fortunately, many attackers are not terribly clever. Unfortunately, there is no way to prove that there is no attacker clever enough not to get caught. I got 60 seconds left for a uh, final little short question. Um, download the software, try it out. Uh, if you want to do a cool Rust project, have a look at RD. If you want to do a cool C project, actually don't don't submit to Tor because we're trying to wind, we're trying to slow down our C development a lot, but, and we're trying not to get a lot of new patches for the C code. So, um, if you're looking for a cool C project, learn Rust. Um, and yeah, that's what I got for today. Thank you for listening. And I'm gonna hang around unless they kick me out, in which case I'll hang around outside. Thanks again. I bet they want this.